following is a production of Locked Up Sports. Everybody, this is Don LaGreca from the Michael K Show. When it comes to talking sports, Bob Walters and Brett Grasso are the authority. Can't wait. When it comes to talking sports, they're the authority. It's Bob Walters and Brett Grasso. It's Locked Up Sports, and it starts now. Bring them out, bring them out. Hey! Bring them out, bring them out. Yeah. Bring them out, bring them out. Hey! hey. Bring them out. Here we go! From the Brian Gunzel Studios, I'm Bob Walters. This is Locked Up Sports. The Giants prepare for the Redskins as they go in 1-5 and five after a tough loss this weekend in Buffalo. The Jets have a bye week. They got the Giants next. They prepare as they get a couple days off from their win over the Eagles. The ALCS and the NLCS are both underway. Game 2 tonight of the NLCS after a big win last night as the Phillies continue to roll. All that plus Mark Mancini right here on Locked Up Sports. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Bob Walters. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and review everything you see here if you're listening on the podcast end or if you're watching on YouTube. Either way, every little bit helps. We got a big show for you here today. A couple things I want to get uh, out of the way here first. Me and Brett did this show on Sunday night, and we watched the Jet game. Then we watched the Giant game, and we did the show out in Sayville. I got home to put it up over the weekend, and there was no sound. And I got to tell you, it was it was probably it was one of the greatest podcast episodes in the history of of anything in the history of podcasting. Uh, we were on top of our game. We were funny. We were looking good. Everything was perfect. And it's a shame because no one will get to see it. There was no sound. It's lost to the universe. So I'm doing the show today. We get, of course, we get uh, Mark Mancini today. So he, this is his first episode of Locked Up Sports that's not a weekend wrap-up. So, you know, we'll get that. I just finished speaking with him. We get all into the, the Dodgers and, and everything. It's great. And then I also would like to know, let everybody know, if I start rambling or something at all today, it's because I haven't slept since... I went to work last night at 9 o'clock at night. I worked until about 3 o'clock this afternoon. It is now almost 7 o'clock p.m. Still have not slept. Going to go in tonight around 1, 2 o'clock, so I will get some sleep after this episode. But let's get into it. You're not here for that. You're here for the sports and the entertainment, so let's get into it. Uh, it was also a good Monday night football game last night, which we, we, which we are going to talk about. But let's talk about the Phillies and the NLCS Game 1 of the NLCS last night in Philadelphia. And listen, the Phillies, I've been saying it for a while now. I just feel like it might be their year. They they came out first pitch in the bottom of the first inning. Schwarber hit it 400-something feet. Then two batters later, you get another home run by Bryce Harper, who has just been on fire. And it just, it seems like, it just kind of seems like it might be the Phillies' year to me. Now, there are other teams. Now, of course, the the Texas Rangers, they might have something to say about it because, I mean, listen, they, they've been mowing through things lately either, and they got a great manager in Bruce Bochy who's been here before. He's won titles. He won titles with the Giants. He's been to the playoffs multiple times with the Padres. He's a good man. He's a great manager. But for the, to me, it just seems like the Phillies, it just it, it all seems to be coming together. They got the pitching that's 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 going great. They got the... The bats are working. Everything seems to be going right. The, the, the place is a, is a madhouse, that Citizens Bank Park. Every night they play, they will play again tonight. It will be um, – you got Kelly going for the D-backs, and you got Nola, Nola 2-0 and with a 1-4-2 ERA in the, in the postseason. Listen, you got to give the edge to the Phillies again tonight. They could take this thing back to Arizona up 2-0. Now, I get it, a series really doesn't start until – say it with me. A home, a team loses a game at home. So the, the Phillies, all they did if they win tonight, if they win tonight, is take care of business and do what they were supposed to do, going to Arizona up 2-0. Now in the other series in the American League, it's a whole nother ball. It's a whole nother ball game. You're talking about a whole nother ball game. You're talking about a 2-0 lead heading home for the Texas Rangers, and they jumped all over. Houston in game two. They jumped all over Javier. He had a big throwing error, as you see right there. It led to runs. They got four in the first inning. 
They added another one. It was 5 nothing. So now what they did was they came back. They, they did put up a fight. They fell short. And now they are in an 0-2 hole heading to Texas. And that's going to be tough for them to dig out of. It's not going to be easy. They get an off night tonight. They pick it up again with Game 3 tomorrow. And tomorrow night, Texas can all but end this series. If they could somehow, if they could somehow beat Houston at home again in Game 3 and take a 3-0 lead, then this series is over. And we are, seem to be heading full steam ahead towards a Texas Rangers, Philadelphia Phillies World Series. And who would have saw that coming, right? Who saw that coming a, a, a month a month ago or eight weeks ago? Nobody. The Phillies were getting hot. They, they, they didn't play as well as they did last year. They weren't as good of a team as last year. And they have just hit their stride at the right time. And so has Texas, the Texas Rangers. Now, you got with the Texas Rangers, with now you, it looks like you're going to get Max Scherzer to pitch a game here. He says he's ready to go. I, I'm, I'm not a fan for it. I'm not a fan of the fact that he was in the, in the locker room after they won the division series celebrating like he had actually contributed at all to that. He cleared waivers three weeks before because of the injury that he was on, and now he's going to pitch in the ALCS. I, to be honest with you, I hope he gets lit up. Because I, I mean, I'm sick of Max Scherzer. I've made it known on this program. I've made it known to people outside of this program that you know I'm pretty much uh, I don't need to hear from Max Scherzer again. So that's what's going on with the baseball tonight. It's the Phillies in Philadelphia against the D-backs. Game two and Philadelphia trying to send this thing. Do what? Take care of business at home. Send it to Arizona up 2-0. Day off tomorrow for that series as the American League Championship Series picks up, and it's it's going to be it's fun. They're listen, October baseball is fun. It's it's dramatic. It look it's starting. To, it really is starting to feel like a Phillies Texas Rangers World Series. Now, is, will this be the end of the Astros dynasty? It it you're coming to that point now, where it, is the team going to you know are they going to stay together? How much longer can they do this? They've made eight straight champion uh, league championship series. How many can they make? Of course, the big disappointments this year in the Dodgers and the Braves, the two best teams record-wise in the major leagues, and they couldn't get out of their own way. They couldn't even make it a week in the playoffs after they got the bye, and they were just they were, they were beat by both the Phillies and the Arizona Diamondbacks. Last night you had uh, Monday Night Football last night, Cowboys and the Chargers, and you know we, we talk about it with Mark in a minute, but – what a, I mean, what a crazy, it, there was 80%, there had to be 80, 85% Cowboys fans in that, in that stadium last night. And you, you got to ask why, and I know Cowboy fans travel, just like Steeler fans travel. There are certain fan bases that just travel well and will always get a certain percentage. But last night it was about 85%. It sounded like a Cowboys home game. And that that's embarrassing. Now, I know LA is not a great sports town. They're front runners. But you got to do better than that. Right, you can't, you can't, you can't have eighty-five percent of the people in there on national TV sound like they're they're pulling for the the road team. Um, it was a big win for the Cowboys, for the Cowboy fans out there. You could take a deep breath. It was a rough week for the Cowboys coming off of the the blowout uh, to the 49ers. There was questions all over Big D about you know play calling, about the the defense. Was the defense good enough? Could they? Could they come up with big plays? They were giving up too many big plays. The offense wasn't converting on any big plays. Dak Prescott is he our guy. All those questions were asked. It was a rough week in Dallas. I'll tell you, it was a rough week in Dallas. And they kind of put that to bed a little bit. It was a it was a it was an ugly win last night for the Cowboys. There was a lot of penalties. There was a whole it really was not, you know, a, a, a real pretty type of win. It wasn't it was a gritty kind of football game. It came down to the end. The Dallas defense stepped up in the end. They got the sacks they needed. They got a sack late. You had you had Herbert playing with a broken finger. It was on his non-throwing hand, but that still is going to affect you. He threw a pick after after the Cowboys went down and kicked the field goal. And that, that drive that the Cowboys did at the end of that game was a big drive in their season because they went down the field. Dak Prescott converted on three huge third-down conversions. He made one real good throw on about a third and nine, which got him into field goal range. The rookie kicker put the chip shot through, and then the defense came up and stepped up and played big, got a pick, and that and, and, and that ended the game. So the Cowboys stay within striking distance of both the 49ers and the Eagles, 
who both lost last week to, you know, losses you really didn't see coming to the Jets and the Browns, respectively. So that's what's going on there. That was a that was a, a good Monday night game. If, if you happen to catch it, I was flipping between the baseball, the Phillies, and the Monday night game. So that's what went on there tonight. It'll be all baseball. I was also flipped in with, with the Rangers going on. But um, tonight you got it's going to be baseball. It's going to be the Phillies. It's the NLCS. It's game two. So that that is what we'll be paying attention to tonight. I would imagine most of you as well. I'm not sure if the Islanders or the, or the Devils or, or anyone's playing like that. I know the Rangers have a night off. I believe the Rangers have a night off. But um, let's get to our. We're going to talk to. We're going to talk Giants Jets coming out of the interview. But now let's get to our interview with Mark Mancini. He, he wasn't here last week. We all know how he feels about the Dodgers. I wanted to give him a forum here, basically to gloat. And here's my interview. Mark Mancini, enjoy the interview. All right, so now we'd like to welcome in our good friend from California by way of Pittsburgh, Mark Mancini. Mark, what's up? How you doing? Welcome to the show. Oh, man, I'm so blessed to be a part of this great show, the show that's sweeping the country, man, on Tuesdays, a throwdown on Tuesdays. That's right. How are you, brother? I'm good. I'm good. We missed you last week because, you know what, last week was an important week because you've been telling us all year how bad the Dodgers were. I got to admit, I thought you were crazy because they they win 100 games every year. They went in to the playoffs. They got the bye. Then they, they faced the uh, the young upstart Arizona Diamondbacks. And then, you know, the floor is yours. Mark, tell us what happened. Uh, definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over again and trying for res- different results. I told you I laid the facts out. I don't just spew the information without laying the facts. And Dodger Nation is myopic enough to not realize that this team is not that good. They haven't won a World Series playing 162 games in 35 years. Check the stats on that. Second thing is this pitching staff is Gladys Knight in the pips. They only had Kershaw. They, you know, threw Julio Urias to the curb. May is uh, Tommy John. Gonsolin is Tommy John. Bueller is Tommy John. You bring in rookies. You, you, you know, the, the, the crazy thing about the Dodgers, what I can't quite figure out, Bob, and I'll try to figure this out with you as we keep getting on more and more of these great shows with you. But you dominate a team during the regular season. That same team comes to play you in the playoffs and takes your ass out. And then the next year, you dominate them again in the regular season. Case in point, the San Diego Padres. So now Arizona takes them out this year. They're 1-6 in in the playoffs against these two teams. Total domination of these two teams in the regular season, I guess it's pretty much four to one almost domination. I think, I think the playoffs are a bit of a crapshoot, though. Too now you're looking at a, a a best three out of five, right? So it's anybody can get swept. Everybody gets swept once or twice during the season. Now the same thing happened to the Braves though this year too. Now you're looking at now now people are questioning: Is it the buy? Should they not have the buy? And like, listen, if you don't want the buy, don't take the buy. But you want to play the a series? You want you want to play a a Here's the thing is, everybody complained when it was a single elimination game, right? When they first started that, everyone said, it, it, you know, it's not the NCAA tournament. They shouldn't do this. 162 games. You can't have that. So they gave them the best two out of three, all played in one ballpark, and they gave the buys out to, to the two top teams. Now that now people are bitching and moaning about the buys because both Atlanta and and uh, the Astros were the only team with the buy to, to, to get through. But the Dodgers lost. The Braves lost. Listen, the Dodgers didn't have good pitching, just like you said. Kershaw came out there. He couldn't get out of the first inning. He had one of the worst all-time starts as far as postseason pitching performances go. That was he gave up six runs. He got one third. He got one out, and he got pulled. And then the same thing happened the next week. I think what happens is the teams just get hot at the right time. They hit their stride. And I think the Diamondbacks have done that. I think the Phillies have done that. Look at the teams that are in there. The Texas Rangers. Well, well here's the thing. And, and, and you, you know, I've done – shows with the Pirates and the Giants, and we've talked about this. The teams that are playing playoff baseball in late August, they're the teams you got to watch out for. Case in point, 2019, the Washington Nationals were left for dead in May, and then they just started resurrecting themselves in the yeah. late stages and they of won the August Super, and they won the World year, Series. and then just rolled. And, and here's the thing. You know, these teams that are bitching and moaning, well, you know, it's not fair and all this. You know what? If you're dumb enough not to practice 
and sit around for five days when these teams are, you know, change your format around or change your way of thinking. You dominate regular seasons. Everybody was telling me to watch out for the Orioles. There's no experience there. I know. You're not going <laughs> to win without experience. The Rangers, they don't have the experience, but they got a manager that has experience. But the, so the, that I, theory the Diamondbacks the don't have experience either. They're a young team. I thought they were a year away. They they probably still are a year, a year or two away from peaking. Well, and, here they, and here they are. They got hot, though. They were hitting the home Well, here's they, the thing, Bob. You, you've been around the block. A connected team is a dangerous team. And you're dealing with the Phillies. You're dealing with the Diamondbacks. You're dealing with teams that care about each other. They, they, they work for each other. They play for each other. Look at the Phillies, man. It's, it, it, you know, I look at Bryce Harper. He reminds me of Kirk Gibson. He reminds me of Pete Rose. That's the way the game should be played. The Dodgers have no leader. They haven't had a leader since they last won it with playing 162 games of Kirk Gibson. You need a leader. They don't have a leader in Los Angeles. No, no. You, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess you're right. That's a fair point that they don't have a leader. Um, but and I you think... know what? You know, you, you know what? You want to know what's going to happen? They're going to stand here and they're going to play the excuse train that oh well, this guy wasn't here, that guy wasn't here. They're going to draw four million fans. They're going to win another division title. And if you want to hang your hat on division titles in the second biggest market, we don't do that in Pittsburgh. Go look at the Steelers and go look at the Penguins. They don't hold division titles. If they don't win a Super Bowl, it's a complete failure in that city. In Los Angeles, all I keep hearing is 10, 11 division titles, 11 out of 12. Hey, look, the Braves did that. that. The Braves did that in the 90s. And all you don't hear about the Braves, you hear about the Yankees. Because the Yankees right. were the dynasty and the Yankees won the championships. You don't need, I mean, you hear about the Braves and what they accomplished in the 90s was great, but well, they the couldn't finish the, the job. Yeah. The problem with the Dodgers is these quick fixes. Like they tried to do it, LeBron and Davis and all these guys. And before that, God rest his soul, Kobe, bringing in Payton and Malone and Shaq. You don't win like that. You got you to gotta develop talent. You bring them up through the system. And this Dodger team, you know, everybody says, I hate them. Yeah, but you know what? When they had Russell, Say, Garvey, and Lopes, I didn't hate them. They ran the operation great. This this is a Mickey Mouse operation, and I'm going to take a page when Wayne Gretzky called the New Jersey Devils a, a, a Mickey Mouse operation. Now, to the teams that are still playing, we had last night. I happen to think that it just seemed, it just feels like it might be Philly's year. Everything seems to be going their way. Bryce ha Bryce Harper's having an all time postseason. He's hitting the ballpark. He's hitting the ball out of the park every night. They 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 did it again last night. They hit a bunch of they hit a bunch of home runs. They hit two home runs in the first inning. What do you think about the Phillies? I I seem to th I think they're going to win this series in, in probably about five games, maybe six. And I think they're going to face uh, Texas Rangers. Well, that's what I said. You know, I got one team standing in the Phillies. They're destined to win it. Bryce Harper plays the game right. Uh, you know, years ago I said I take Bryce Harper. Over Mike Trout, people said you're crazy, but I, I still will take Bryce Harper. Plays all out, and if you're not playing that all out type of style with him, you're going to be on the outside looking in. You know, they say a legend's determined by winning the World Series. You know, Charles Barkley didn't win an NBA championship. Robert Ory won seven of them. Are you going to tell me Robert Ory's a better basketball player than Charles Barkley? No, Barry no, Bonds and... didn't. Barry Bonds didn't win a a World Series. Uh, Bryce Harper is yet to win one right now, but these players, man, play all out, and I love them. And uh, they've already eclipsed anything that a lot of people have done winning a World Series or winning an NBA championship. And they, 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 they just seem to be the way – I mean, the, the, the city is 100% is behind them. They're singing the songs. The place is rocking. The Citizens Bank Park, I've heard a lot of uh, Sports Talk Radio hosts, actually, uh, the last week or so, talking about how, oh, there's a lot of talk about the Phillies ballpark being so loud. Every ballpark is loud. That place seems to be a, a rocking. Now, I get it. Every ballpark is loud during the playoffs. But that place seems to be a little different. It seems to be like an unfinished bit, an unfinished business situation from last year. I just see them. I just, it just feels like it might be their year and it might be going their way. I could be dead wrong. I, you know, Anything could happen. And the, the Texas Rangers going in to Houston and taking the first two of that series is huge. And now Houston's in a huge hole here. Well, they brought in the relief in, in uh, Texas and they've addressed that issue. Uh, they're clicking on all cylinders. Pitching's the name of the game, but the, the, 
get back on your point with Philadelphia. That's a, that's that's like playing uh, in hell for four hours. Yeah, I mean, that is a house of horrors. I mean, uh, for those visiting teams coming in that place, and you're right. You know, when you look at it, Schwarber and all these guys. I mean, it's it's it reminds me of the Brewers in the '80s when they had. Uh, you know Harvey's Wallbangers. Yeah, it's a team I mean, of mercenaries. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a homegrown team. None of those guys are homegrown, really. You have you have right. Harper. You have Zach Wheeler was a Met, obviously. Yeah, the whole the whole bunch of them are, are are mercenaries from other teams. But the city's falling in love with them. Now I wanted to get before I let you go. I wanted to get uh, quick on the Steelers had a buy. The you're covering the game this week. Steelers yeah. Rams. Uh, what what do you uh, give us a little bit on the Steelers and the Rams? Because the Rams and Cooper Cup coming up and playing. Looks like he hasn't missed a step. Well, he hasn't missed a step, but the the, you know, the Rams, you know, let's face it, they're they're surprising some teams. I mean, you know, they beat an Arizona team this past uh, weekend. They're going to get the Steelers now. The Steelers, another cross country flight. Uh, they got to do one later in the year uh, up to Seattle, but they went from Vegas uh, to Houston, and then they went back home, beat the Ravens, and had a bye. So. This comes at a good time, having your bye week as you come out to California again. So uh, I, I like the Steelers uh, in this one. It's going to feel like another home game. I mean, last night, uh, you kind of oh, yeah, felt like you were in Dallas. I like the, the Chargers, the Cowboy too. I know. 80%. The, tra- the, 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 Cowboy, mean, the Cowboys fans always travel, though, but so do the Steelers fans. So you're right. It's going to be – and L.A. is not, notoriously not a great sports town. They're, they're notorious front runners, you know, with everybody. Well, you, you I know, know you, you – I love the giggle that you – because you know it. You know that's true, right? Yeah. No, the Bears will be out here later on in the year. You know, the 49ers come in there. It's it's almost like a, a home game away from home. Uh, yeah. And, boy, that yesterday it was drowned out, man. Yeah, that's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. Like, they moved from San Diego up to L.A., they move from San Diego to LA, and and look, they they get nobody, they get nobody, they can't have fans. Yeah, they kind of you, you kind of feel like the Clippers. Exactly, exactly. And I happen to like the Chargers. I've always liked the Chargers. I, I like them with Rivers. I like them. I, like, I think Herbert's a great quarterback. I think he's going to be one of the best, you know, in in the league. He already is, but I think he's going to be in that top top level. And I think I hope he gets a Super Bowl one day. Now, before I let you go, real quick, Mark, I wanted to show you this as our. Top two teams in the Metro. It's early. It's early. But the top two teams in the Metropolitan Division, Pittsburgh Penguins, New York Rangers. I can't wait to play your ass, man. And, and you and I go back and forth with this thing. <laughs> oh, it's going to be uh, good. I, let's hope they can be in the playoffs. Know, what, well, here's the big key. I, I, I said this on a show, that if my Penguins don't end up winning the Cup, I will tell you, watch out for the Toronto Maple Leafs. They will win the Cup this year. Yeah, they just disappoint year after year. Though they're like they're like almost. Yeah, but they have the best. Yeah, they have some of the best players, and they can't win. They they went that city went crazy. Like it was like here when the Knicks won a playoff uh, the a playoff series. They, the city went crazy. It was embarrassing to be a New Yorker and that. Come on, we're New York. Act like you've been there. Toronto's the same way. They're an original six. They're an all time team. They can't get they can't get out of their own way in the playoffs. Yeah, and you know what? But you know the the, the thing what, what I like about him, and I've always liked Austin Matthews. I would take him over Connor McDavid any day of the week. People have been laughing. Look what Connor McDavid is doing now compared to what uh, Austin Matthews is just tearing up the league right yeah, now. Yeah, I think He's I think Edmonton. Back to back I think Edmonton could win it before Toronto. Ooh, I'm gonna stay. That's every you know Wayne Gretzky said the same thing, but. I don't think so. I think Edmonton, um, you know, I don't think the West is as good as the East, so you might have a little bit of an advantage. But um, I, I think that kid in Chicago is going to be better than McDavid. Uh, yeah, man, possibly. I mean, possibly, but it's hard to tell. Look at the Rangers have two two top, top picks in Capo Caco yeah. and Alexi Lafreniere, and both have – they've both been okay players, and this is a big year for Lafreniere after signing the contract. But they have not been top five, top three. Picks yeah, but look at what all. we've done in Pittsburgh, man. We've we've retooled over there, brought in Riley Smith from Vegas. Oh man, he Dude, reminds listen. me of a Thomas Sandstrom, man. Chris Kunitz. <laughs> that's, that's an old school name. The two best teams in that division are Carolina and the Devils. They're faster than everybody. Well, they got see, more well, skill than everybody. Here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. And and you know, we had the Devils on yesterday talking about it. I think it's going to come down to goaltending in New Jersey. Uh, they, they're young. They got speed. They took out the Rangers at big front line of the Rangers. But Carolina, 
Uh, I'm not sold on that goaltender that's been, you know, in more uh, hotels than some stewardesses. You need an adequate goal. Now, if they had a Borowski type or somebody like that, they got good four good lines coming at you. But Carolina doesn't, you know, they don't they don't show me. You need goaltending. And I well, wish Pittsburgh had picked up Gibson from Anaheim out here, a local kid too. But uh, watch out the Penguins, man. They, they've, they've retooled. They've got a lot of guys. Lars Eller, they got Carlson now, Smith. They got some guys, man. The Penguins are going to be tough. Well, the best goalie in the NHL resides between the pipes at the world's most famous arena, Igor Shesterkin. Mark Mancini, thank you for joining us. Next week, next week we'll talk about your experience, what, what you covered here with the uh, the Rams yeah, blowout yeah. I, of the I, Steelers. I, I, I love you dearly, <laughs> and I can't wait for the blue shirts to go against the black and gold of the Steel City. And, and I'm holding you to it. You come out, you get you get your ass out of here somehow. I want to get out there. I want to take... go out there, and I want to sit in the stands with you wearing a penguin. Uh, I'm jersey. taking you to the garden. I, I'm going to be right there, right next to me. Penguin shirt on. What do you got? A Lemieux jersey? What do you got? Crosby? Yeah, I, I, I got uh, I got one that uh, I, I got uh, either one. I got a Riley Smith one too. Okay, okay. I thought you I thought so, you'd but, pull but, out the, but, the Tom Barrasso or Ron Francis jersey. You seem like I that kind of guy. Hey, listen, I got a t shirt that says Cleveland sucks, feel a Pittsburgh lumber as well. You want me to bring that? <laughs> Mark Mancini's his name, Mark. We'll talk to you next week. I love you, brother. Have a good one. <laughs> How about that? Mark Mancini, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know what? Listen, I, I, I thought he was a lunatic too for some of the things that he said. I knew he was that he had the hatred for the Dodgers, but I thought it was kind of like that blind hatred that I have for the Yankees. Like you know, I know obviously deep down I know the Yankees are a good franchise, but I don't like to say it because I don't like the Yankees and it's a personal thing. And you know, it's the growing up through the dynasty. I thought he kind of had that, but hey, he got it right and he's gotten a lot of things right on this show that he has uh, forecasted that had, that seemed crazy at the time and have come to come to fruition. And he's also covering the Steelers and the Rams this week. We'll see how that goes. We're going to talk to him next week about that. Uh, the Giants and the Jets, uh, I haven't gotten the chance to really talk about the games this past Sunday. Uh, listen, let's start with the Giants. The Giants, the defense played well, okay? They played better. It was, it was a better game. It was still was not pretty. Tyrod Taylor held the held the offense together, I think, better than Daniel Jones did. Now, now that's not saying that I think Tyrod Taylor should be the Giants' quarterback, or I think he should, you know, he be he's the future because he's certainly not. He's older. He is one of the best backups in the league, though. He you don't lose that much when you go to Tyrod Taylor. He's a professional. He's a professional quarterback. He knows what he's doing. He gets a grasp of the offense. He's not going to kill you like some backup quarterbacks in this league will, but. At the end of the first half, he killed the Giants, okay? this Him checking this down to a run is something that just cannot happen, okay? You have to have, you have some kind of situational awareness as to what is going on in the game. You have to, you can't check down to a run with 13 seconds left, not, not put it in the end zone, okay? You're at the one-yard line. You check down to everybody needs to know this, and everybody does know this, okay? What's going on that you can't run, that you basically can get two shots in the end zone, throw it into the end zone, throw it out of the back of the end zone, don't take a sack, and if you score, great. If not, kick the field goal. Live to see another day. Get points. You have to get points when you're on the two-yard line in the last seconds of the first half. And the Giants, clearly what happened was they gave him a play call, which he could check to a run, and I'm sure Brian Dable went to the offensive coordinator, and I'm sure he went to everybody and was like, he knows not to run this, right? And you, you had, I'm sure they said yes because I'm sure they thought he did know not to run this. Because if this is a, a if a high school kid makes this play, this mistake, it's unforgivable. This in an NFL game, an NFL quarterback, a veteran who has been a starter in this league, who has been in this league for a long time, has got to know better. And he gave it right to, to, to the running back, and he got stuffed at the line, and the Giants had no chance to get a playoff. They, they rushed to the line. They, they didn't stand a chance. And even, even Mike Tirico, who pretty much usually plays it down the middle, was like, what a terrible, terrible clock management. He got even emotional about it. And it wasn't. And you don't see Mike Tirico get like that. And that's how bad of a play it was. And it cost the Giants three points, and in the end, it did cost them the game. 
Now, you can say the game would have played out different. I, I get it, the butterfly effect and everything. But let's be real. The bottom line is the Giants get those three points, which were pretty much a sure thing. Then at the end of the game, they don't have to wor- rely on getting a touchdown. They don't have to stick it in the end zone. They can get in field goal range, bleed the clock down to three seconds, and kick the game-winning field goal and get out of Buffalo with a much-needed win. This team needed a win in the worst way, and this would have been a good one to get. Again, they don't score touchdowns. That's a whole other thing. The offensive line was, again, inept, but it did run block a little bit. I, 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 I mean, I guess you're looking for little things with this offensive line and with this team in general. So now the, the, the season's basically over. You're one and five. I know it doesn't officially end until you lose that eighth game. You know, until you lose the eighth game, technically you're pretty much still alive. But this game, let's uh, looking at it from a realist perspective, the, the season's over, right? They have one game left, with, which is going to be the Cowboys game later in the season might be consequential. But they play the Jets in two weeks. And that's the game that the, that's going to be the Giants Super Bowl. And the Jets should watch out because the Giants are going to come in there and they're going to play that like the biggest game of the year. But getting back to this Buffalo game, again, you had you they, they did everything right. The recipe for a upset was there. They were 17 and a half point underdogs in some places. They were the largest underdog of the season out of all the games so far, all the NFL games. And then they had a chance, okay, with the pass interference, gave them an untimed down. They had a chance for a walk-off win. And I'm not, I wasn't crazy about the play call here where he throws it kind of like a, a jump lob pass to the back of the end zone. That's a tough throw to make. There's not a lot of room there. That's a tough throw to make. Now, was it pass interference? Listen, it probably was pass interference, okay? If you want to be real, he had, a, he had his hand full of jersey. It probably was a pass interference by the book, but you're not going to get that call. They just called one on the play before. They got an untimed, and you got, got you an untimed down from the one yard line. I personally, there, I would have probably run it. I would have given it to Barkley, my best player, and see if he could make something happen, or maybe do a misdirection and, and try and find Barkley on a, on a little swing pattern, and have him get it and try and dart to, towards the corner of the end zone. That's what I would have done. The play they called there—that's a tough throw to make. Was it pass interference? Yeah, it it was, but you're not going to get that call there. And, and I don't want to hear from the people, oh, it, it, if it's pass interference on the first play of the game, it's pass interference on the last play of the game. They're human beings out there. Different situations. It's not going to be called exactly the same as on in, with five minutes left in the first quarter as it's going to be called on an untimed down with the game on the line. It's just not. Was he face guarding? Was he grabbing his jersey? Yeah, he was. Was the throw? It's a tough throw. That's a tough throw for any quarterback to make. You got to have a lot of touch on that throw, and you got to find a, You got to, you know, kind of drop it in the drop it in the bucket perfectly. Is Tyrod Taylor that kind of quarterback? I don't think he is either. Now, did the offense run smoother with Tyrod Taylor? I think it did. I think that the offense ran smoother. I think he was. The, it just seemed to be more cohesive. The offensive line protected him. He ran the ball well. It it looked a little bit better, but it's the same result. You know, it's the same result. They didn't stick it in the end zone once. They got three field goals. They still have not scored an offensive touchdown in the first half of a game this year, which, I mean, come on. We're now coming up on the halfway point of the season. And you don't have an offensive touchdown in the first half of the season, in the first half of a game. It's a disaster this whole season. But I blame the coaching the most. Brian Dable is, and he's not going anywhere. Okay, I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't I don't think I think he bought himself some political capital with last year. He bought himself a little bit of something. He bought himself a bad year. I also think the Giants played above their heads last year and I said that to you a couple times. But I but I you know, we didn't think it was going to be this. 1 and 5, just a, a a a terrible offense that can't put the ball in the end zone period. But here we are and they got the Redskins coming into MetLife this weekend. It, I mean, you, you got the you got the Redskins. The Redskins are not a good team. This is definitely a winnable game for the Giants. It's absolutely a winnable game for the Giants. I think they 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 win this week. They get the two and five. This season's still over. Listen, don't get me wrong. They're, this team's not going anywhere. They're not competing with the the Cowboys and the Eagles and the 49. They, they're not going to the playoffs. I think the Minnesota Vikings have a better chance of going to the playoffs than the Giants do. 
but but that's a whole other thing. They're gonna they they are gonna play that jet jet game tough. Now don't look ahead to it. You got the Redskins. It's not gonna be easy. They're kind of an even team with the red with the with the Commanders, who are probably you know they might be a little bit better the Commanders, but it's a home game. I think the Giants beat them, and I think Tyrod Taylor should get the start in this one. Let Daniel Jones get get healthy. Okay, this is a neck thing. He's had neck things in the past. The neck is not something you want to mess around with. You're paying this guy a lot of money for a lot more years. Let him sit on the bench this week. It doesn't mean I think Tyrod Taylor, is, this is his team or anything like that. Just let Tyrod Taylor play. I think he earned himself another start. Can we agree on that? He earned himself another start. He played well enough, which is embarrassing in itself because it was not a very good performance. But he played well enough to get another start against the Redskins at home. Let him have it. Then bring Daniel Jones back for the Jets game and try to get an upset and try and, you know, ruin their season a little bit. So that's what's going on with the Giants. As far as the Jets are concerned, listen, the Jets got themselves a win. It was a big upset. I had kind of seen it coming. I had said that I, I wouldn't be surprised if they beat the Eagles. The Eagles were not playing great. There's no real dominant team this year. The Eagles, they, they were undefeated. And that you get a lot of credit for that because it's not easy to go – to win five or six games in a row in this league. But they wouldn't, they had, they had terrible red zone efficiency went towards the bottom of the league. They weren't putting the ball in the end zone. They were settling for three a lot. The defense, I thought, would give a problem to the, the front four of the Eagles. I thought would give a problem to the Jets in being able to protect Zach Wilson. He played okay. Zach played okay. He, 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 I'd say a C plus is what I'd give Zach Wilson. He didn't win the game. He certainly didn't win the game. He was a game manager, but he didn't lose the game. The Jets' defense stepped up big. The Eagles turned the ball over four times, the last one being the, the crusher, which if you're Jalen Hurts, you cannot, you cannot make that throw under any circumstances. Under no circumstances can you ever make that throw where it even is close to being picked off. Throw it away. Do anything. Because if you punt the ball back to the Jets there, you don't pick up a first down. Let's say they punt the ball back to the Jets. You give you give Zach Wilson 75 yards and a minute and a half to do it. He's not scoring. He's not taking this team down and giving them the lead. He's just not good enough. I don't care what I've seen from Zach Wilson. He is not taking the team in under two minutes, 70 yards to win the game. In any game. But again, the Jets got the, the defense stepped up. They got the pick. They got it down to inside the 15-yard the line. And then on the first play, the Eagles let them score. They let them score. He probably should have gone down at the one-yard line. I'm not one of those that's going to get upset either way about that because you take the points, especially when you're the Jets or the Giants, for example. You take the points, okay? I know the, the, the theory, go down, bleed the clock down to three seconds, kick the chip shot field goal, and, and get the hell out of there with the win. But – too many things could go wrong. And it is the Jets. Let's not forget it is the Jets. So I, I have no issue with him going into the end zone and scoring there. It's a little dangerous because you left him a minute 46, and that's a lot of time. But, again, you have such a you have a good defense where you get the ball in the end zone and you just you hand it on over to your defense and say, win us this game. We need a stop. We need one more stop. And that's what they did. Four straight plays and out, and the Jets get out of MetLife with their biggest win in a long time. They've had two wins now against the Bills and the and the Eagles. Both good wins, both kind of handed to them by the other team. Because those turnovers by by both Hurts and by the Bills on the opening week killed them. Killed them. The Jets don't win the game without those. Now they did get them. They did force the turnovers. They have been getting to the quarterback better. The defense is really coming into its own. The problem is still the offense. It's still not a very good offensive team. Zach Wilson has bought himself a couple more weeks here, especially now that Kirk Cousins has said that he has no interest in being traded. And you know what? That, that's where it ends there with Kirk Cousins because he has a no trade clause, so he has the final say. It just it is what it is. You could go for him. You could try to get him. You could even make a deal with the Vikings for Kirk Cousins. If he doesn't sign off on it, he's not going, he's not going anywhere. But the Jets now come into the bye week and, and that's a huge win for the Jets, okay? They're now at 3-3. Three and three. You're in the thick of the playoff hunt. You're, you're, you're right there. Or they're probably on the lower end because of who they are and because of the way the makeup of the team and the offense not being very good. But they're there. 
that three and three is the best you could ask for as a Jets fan going into this bye week. And then you got a huge game against the Giants and the Jets have to win that game. The Jets cannot let the Giants beat them in on the head to head to get the back. The Giants playing for the back pages. That's the Super Bowl. This isn't just a game that the Jets really should win. The Jets are a better team. Hands down, they have a much better defense. Their offensive line is, even though it's mediocre offensive line the Jets have, it's still leaps and bounds ahead of the, what the garbage that the Giants are putting out week after week on the offensive line. I mean, you had and give Justin and give give Pew credit. Give Pew credit. He came off the couch and he's playing left tackle in the NFL. I don't know what you want to do. I saw it online a lot of people. There was a play where the, where the guy blew past Pew, but the, the guy, and you heard the introductions on the, on the telecast from my couch. You know, that's where he said he was from. Came coming from my couch, Justin Pew. So, give him credit. He played well. It's a, you. That is not easy. He has been sitting around. He hasn't played football in a while. To get off your couch, get into the facility probably on Tuesday or Wednesday, have two, three days of practice, and then get out there in a live game situation and not be just an embarrassment and be better than most of the people next to him. He was better than Neil again. Now the Giants, when they get Thomas back, they, I, they hopefully should get Thomas back by the Jets game. Barkley came back. You saw the spark that he could provide. Daniel Jones, I say sit him out another week because it, it, it's not about this year anymore. I'm not even saying it ever was really about this year. It kind of was for the fans. I think the Giants saw the writing on the wall. They knew they played above their head last year. They knew they probably weren't that good. They got the breaks that they needed. They got the turnovers that they needed. They won the close games. None of that is happening this year. There haven't been many close games. There was this one, which they lost. The Bills are a better team. And you saw what the Bills did coming out of the the halftime when they got the ball. after The the Giants got it first. They gave it back to the Bills. The Bills went on a 10-play, no, I'm sorry, a 16-play, 10-minute drive. It ate up most of the third quarter. And it was just, it was picture perfect. They just kind of ran it, and they overpowered the Giants, and they got their first touchdown. And once they got that, then you kind of saw the, the momentum starting to shift. I mean, the Giants, give the Giants defense credit, though. They held the Buffalo Bills, who are a high-powered offense. Now, not as, not as so much this year. But in the past couple of years, they have been a very high-powered offense. They held them scoreless for three quarters. That's not easy. And you get you got to give credit where credit is due. The Giants' defense played well. You had the secondary playing inspired. You had the, the linebackers making plays, shooting into the backfield, the, making tackles for loss. They, they made Josh Allen run for his life a bunch of times. Give them credit. But again, the offense just couldn't stick it in. And they lost the game. And that's all it is. There's no moral victories either. I don't want to hear, well, we played better. We looked better. I don't want to hear it, Giants fans. Because I'm going to tell you guys the same thing I said to the Jets fans two weeks prior when they did the pretty much the same thing against the Chiefs. Kept it close. There are no moral victories in the NFL. Okay? There's a win column. There's a loss column. And both of those games for the Giants against the Bills this week and for the Jets against the Chiefs a couple weeks ago, both go in the loss column. And that's it. End the story. The defense played better. They didn't give up 11 sacks. They gave up three sacks, right? They had an un- untimed down at the one-yard line for, to win the game, and they, they couldn't convert. And again, I didn't like the play call because I think it's a tough throw for any quarterback to make, and there's a lot of touch you need on that throw to try and get it over the defender. And was it pass interference? I think it probably was. I do. I think it probably was pass interference. But you're not going to get that call. And I didn't expect the flag. I wasn't yelling at the TV. Oh, it's pass interference, pass interference. Because I know they're human beings. Referees are human beings. And they're not going to throw that flag. They gave you one on the play before. You got your own time down. That's your chance. Do it now or do it never. So that's that. So just to recap, I want to get out of here because I got to get some sleep. I'm... I'm in bad shape here, people. <laughs> um, we got tonight, NLCS Game 2. Nola and Kelly are the pitchers. Phillies trying to take a 2-0 series lead. The ALCS resumes tomorrow with a, a, a commanding lead for the Texas Rangers heading home to their own ballpark. They got a 2-0 lead. 
desperation time for the Houston Astros. They need to win tomorrow. It's now or never for them because you cannot go down 3-0. And Bruce Bochy, I told you Bruce Bochy, watch him. I do think they're going to get stopped by the Phillies in the World Series. I think this is the Phillies' year. I want to touch on Coach Prime um, and Colorado. Listen, they, they blew a 29-point lead. They had a they had a huge lead at halftime. They, they, they were blowing them out. They were 12-and-a-half-point favorites. And at home, they let a, a, a bad Stanford team come all the way back and beat them in double overtime. And this is a big hit for Dion and for the Colorado team this year. They, they don't have many winnable games left on their schedule. They're going to have to surprise us again with one or two more wins to get bowl eligible. You just get got to get bowl eligible. And, and, and there's not a bowl in America that was not going to want that Colorado team. But this was not a good look for him. He came out. He was talking about how he, he didn't like the fact that they were scheduled for Friday night. Listen, you're, you're now a prime time. You're prime time. You're on prime time. And, and come on. What kid, kid, college kids can't stay up late on a Friday night. Let's be real. Making excuses. That was an excuse. It was an excuse before the game. Then they went out. They took a commanding lead. They dominated the first half. They had a 29-point lead. And to blow a 29-point lead, I mean, that that's up there on the all-time blown leads. The all-time comebacks. And it was on the road. Not a good week for Dion and Colorado. So I just wanted to... to Get that off our chest because we talk about Dion. We had uh, the guy who wrote the book um, on last week. By the way, pick up the book. If you haven't gotten it yet, get get it. Right, not much time left. Make sure you get it. Um, so I think a bad loss for Colorado. I think the season's kind of starting to go downhill a little bit. But let's see how they react to the adversity. They don't have many, like I said, they don't have many winnable games left. They have a tough schedule. It's not easy playing in that conference, especially a team like Colorado, who's been a, who's been a bottom dweller for a long time. Now, this doesn't take away from what he did earlier in the season, Dion, but it is it's starting to die down a little bit, right? With Colorado, just the whole coach prime, it's starting to die down just a bit nationwide. I'm sure in Colorado, it's as big as ever. I'm sure in the South, they're still talking about it. Nationwide, coast to coast, it's dying down just a little bit. So, and now you got hockey underway. You got basketball right around the corner. So it, it's a good time of year. Uh, the World Series next week. So a whole bunch going on. I want to thank everybody for watching. Don't forget to rate. Don't forget to review. Don't forget to subscribe. Every little bit helps. If you're on the podcast end, just do it there wherever you're listening. If you're here, on YouTube, make sure you catch us here and rate, re, rate, review, and subscribe. You know what? Do it on both. Watch us on YouTube, then switch on over, listen to the episode on the podcast, and review them both and tell us how which one was better. And I'm going to tell you, you guys, it, it was a great, great show that me and Brett did. It's, it was one of the old-timers. We were on top of our game. It, everything was funny. It was on point. We knew our stats, everything. It was entertaining. And no one will ever hear it because it's lost to the universe. There was no sound. I mean, I went to college for this. I did. I went to college for this. So I'm good at talking. And I'm good at, you know, somewhat entertaining. I would ho at least hope entertaining you for a little bit. But as far as the technical stuff goes, I mean, I'm just throwing, I'm just throwing, you know, I'm just throwing it at the wall, hoping it sticks. Because this is not, even when I went to college, this is not the kind of equipment that they had. It's, it's a whole nother ball game. So... It was bound to happen, right? The, uh, the episode with no sound, it was bound to happen. Sooner or later, it happened this week. We're going to get Brett back again next week. That does it for me. I got to get to sleep. I'll talk to you, everybody, in a couple days. We will do another show this week. It'll probably be Thursday, Friday, maybe, maybe Friday. Um, so I'll talk to you Friday. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Till next time, everybody. Till next time, everybody. I'm Bob Walters. See ya.